You know, um, when we were praying over our children, I was reminded of this Sunday school class. I guess they were four or five-year-olds, and it was on Easter Sunday. And the teacher was teaching the children about the resurrection. And she told them about how Jesus had died, and he was dead for three days, and then he rose back to life and walked out of the tomb. And the kids were sitting there, and they... They acted like, you know, they had the look on their face like they didn't really understand. And she says, I tell you what, I want you to use your imagination, children. And if you died and came back to life in three days and walked out of a tomb, what what would be the first thing you said? What would be the first words out of your mouth? And a little girl in the back, her name was Parker, she stood up and she said, (laughs) Ta-da! out of the mouths of babes. Now, I will tell you that as the Lord... (laughs) Yes. As, As the Lord was putting on my heart what to bring today, uh... There's family all over this, but, but I do want to start out by saying that, that it's going to get a little heavy, and I'm going to keep it as rated G as I can for the children. But I don't have to remind anyone here that this world is going through a time where there's much tribulation. The coronavirus pandemic has changed the world forever. Specifically here in America, we have an inflation rate of historic proportions. There's a shortage of basic food items. There's an increase in crime and lawlessness. There's a recent explosion of mass shootings. Death from suicide and drug overdose is at an all-time high. And the country is so divided politically that there is hate and distrust rampant among many Americans. And even in this house, this church family, we have seen a recent unexpected and shocking loss that has devastated the Christmas family and has left many of us with a sense of uncertainty questioning things that we thought were unquestionable. And you know, you just have to watch the nightly news and you'll quickly discover that the predominant attitude in the world today, the world's perspective, is one driven by uncertainty, which causes fear. And fear can lead to despair. And we see that all over the world today, despair. And that despair has produced anger. There are many angry people right now. And all of that uncertainty and fear ultimately leaves people with a sense of hopelessness. So today I'd like us to focus on this question. Is there any hope? But first, I want to remind you that as believers in Christ, as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ, as a people chosen by God and filled with His Holy Spirit, our perspective and attitude should be the complete opposite of the world's. Mm. Instead of a sense of hopelessness, fear, and despair, our hearts should be filled with hope. And because of that hope, we should have a sense of peace that leads to spiritual joy and comfort. You know, when I speak about hope, it reminds me of the hope of a young boy at a little league baseball game. So he was sitting in the bleacher all by himself. 
his, the rest of his team was out on the field. He, he was kind of like the bench warmer. And a man arrived late to the game and saw the little boy by himself. And he went up to the boy and he said, hey, what's the score? And the boy said, well, it's 18 to nothing and we're behind. And the man says, well, wow, you must be really discouraged. And the little boy looked at him and smiled and said, why should I be discouraged? I haven't even gotten up to bat yet. Now that's hope. But you know, when most people hear that word hope, or when they use it in a sentence, it's pretty much in line with the dictionary's definition. Take a look at what the dictionary defines hope as. It says to have a wish to get something or do something or for something to happen or be true, especially something that seems possible or likely. So according to that definition, the world sees hope as a wish or a desire. Hope for the world is a longing for something that may or may not happen. I hope it doesn't rain on my wedding day. I hope the LSU Tigers win today, which may or may not happen depending on who they're playing. Roll Tide. (laughs) Sorry, Pastor. I hope Ray's sermon is really short today, which may or may not happen. (laughs) You know, the Bible teaches us a vastly different definition of hope. Listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah. He, He says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Confidence. And the Apostle Paul put it this way, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with what kind of hope? Confident hope. Mm. Mm. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, that word hope is in the Bible over 180 times. And you know, I, I pray, God, give me what, let's boil it down. Show me what the Bible's short definition of hope is. Because we can read about hope all through the Bible. Here's what he put on my heart. He said, it is a deep, settled confidence There's that word confidence that God will keep his promises. Mm. A deep, settled confidence means no more debate or uncertainty, no more guessing or wishing. Hope in the Bible is not a wish. It means that we know. And if you've been in church family for any, any amount of time, we know that we know that God keeps his promises. Did you know that there are 7,487 promises made by God in the Bible? That's incredible. 7,487 promises. But the really amazing thing about all those promises is that each and every one of them are fulfilled in Christ. Check out what Paul tells us about God's promises. He says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. Guarantees. No more wishing. No more debating. Deep, settled confidence. In other words, God keeps his promises. Do you believe that today? 
Do you really believe that? Well, you know, if we really believe that, then I would ask you this. Why do some of us, and I'm part of that, sometimes we go to prayer as a last resort? Something happens in our life and we need resolution and, and we start to rely on our own powers or the power of others to get us through this issue. And when all that fails, then we go to prayer. You know, when we go to prayer as a last resort, it really shows what we think about our Father and what He has promised us. God promises to hear and answer our prayers. Psalm 65, 5 says that God faithfully answers our prayers with awesome deeds. He promises that. So if we truly believe that God keeps His promises, then prayer should be our first choice when we have an issue that needs resolution. Now God makes those 7,000 promises And there are two types of promises that God makes to us. There are conditional promises and unconditional promises. An unconditional promise, that's a promise that's made without us having to do anything in return. It's unconditional. Some examples are, He promises to be close to the brokenhearted and to rescue those whose spirits are crushed. 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1, there's a passage there on comfort. And it says, it starts out by naming God as the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. And in the first five verses of that passage, that word comfort is used ten times in five verses. The original language, that word is parakaleo, which literally means to call alongside. Now, it's not about coming alongside and patting on the shoulder and and saying, bless you, I'm praying for you. This, this This is a sincere, sincere, deep understanding of compassion. Our loving Father is never preoccupied or removed from us when we are enduring sadness or affliction. He is the God of all comfort. Mm. Another unconditional promise is that He will never destroy the world again by a flood. That's unconditional. It doesn't matter what we do, He's not going to destroy it by a flood. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will remain faithful. He intercedes for us. And He will return again. Unconditional. We don't have to do anything for that. Now the conditional promise, that's a promise that is subject to certain qualifications or requirements. Most conditional promises, excuse me, they start off with the word if. God says, if you do something, then I will do something. That's a conditional. It's important that we understand the difference and the context of a promise. It's not wise to pick a random promise and claim it for our own. It, It could be a conditional promise and we don't meet those requirements. A great example of a conditional promise from God regarding the current social and cultural turmoil in America is in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And most of us are familiar with this passage. It says, then if, there it is, it's a condition. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. Mm. But notice that God says, if my people, 
He's not talking to those people who have hard, unregenerate hearts. He's not talking to those who are promoting lawlessness, racism, and injustice. He's talking to those he calls the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He's talking to you and me. I wish I could stay here, but I want to show you a few more promises for Christians today. And I want, to, I want to ask you, see if you can determine if they're conditional or unconditional. So the first one is Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Conditional or unconditional? That, that's a conditional. You've got to come to him to get the rest. Philippians 4, 19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Conditional, unconditional. That's an unconditional promise. We don't have to do anything. He's going to take care of us. Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Conditional, right? We have to do certain things and then we'll be saved. But here's the question, I think. What does it mean to be saved? Hmm. So I was a, an elder in a church years ago, and, and this was in Southern California near Los Angeles in an affluent area. I didn't live in the affluent area. I just went to church that was in the affluent area. And we were doing some street evangelism, uh, evangelism one weekend. And I'm walking through this neighborhood and I'm looking at these mansions and these big boats and these, these uh, foreign sports cars parked everywhere. And as I went up to the door, this one particular mansion, the gentleman answered the door and he had his, his Gucci, you know, uh, sand, uh, slippers on and his you know, with, with diamonds hanging everywhere. And, and I started telling him about Jesus and, and about the story of salvation. And he stopped me. He said, I don't mean to be rude, Ray, but let me ask you a question. What do I need to be saved from? Have you looked around? I don't need to be saved from nothing. I've got everything I want. When he said that to me, it, it hit me kind of hard because I was at a loss for words. And I'm praying, Holy Spirit, help me answer this question. And nothing came. So I walked away feeling dejected and, and feeling like I wasn't worthy to be even one of his children because I couldn't share the good news. And then a couple of days later, I was doing my Bible study and I came across 1 Peter 3.15 which tells us that if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do it in a gentle and respectful way. He says, be ready to explain it, which means you got to get prepared. You, you need to have a script to go by. Now, I'm not saying to be a robot and read from a card, but have something, have a, have a plan. And then ask Holy Spirit to help you speak that plan eloquently. We've got to keep it simple. It says to be gentle and it says to be respectful. We also need to keep it simple so they understand what we're talking about. We want to avoid using church language. Sometimes we've got a tendency to get too churchy, right? Or, or, or use theological statements. Don't say something like this, okay? Don't say this. Well, when we exercise hermeneutics and correctly exegete and not eisegete, we will see in the word that the Messiah was born by immaculate conception and became the propitiation and atonement for our transgressions and apostasy, and we will start to prophesy the eschatology of the advent. His blood established the new covenant, and when we surrender to His sovereignty, deity, and divinity, we will understand His omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence 
and we will experience sanctification. And when we are in Christ, we will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Ghost. And finally, reach eternal glorification. <laughs> you know, I, I put together my, this is mine. And I'm just saying this because if you don't have a plan when you meet an un unbeliever and they ask you yeah. here's another example when I worked in the corporate world and I was surrounded by engineers and and software folks and and they were from all over the country and and one of my good friends he was from the country of India and it was Good Friday he came by my office and said, Ray, I, I, I know you worship Jesus Christ. I just want to know if he died on that Friday, why do they call it Good Friday? Yes, Whoo, I was ready. Yeah. I was ready. Yeah. He's now worshiping Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I, I put this thing for me, and, and I just kind of say that that salvation, being saved, means that Jesus Christ has rescued us from the penalty of our sin. Amen. He paid the penalty for each of us by sacrificing His life on the cross. Yes, and then I tell them, the Bible tells us that the penalty for sin is death. Yes. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Yes. And that God loves us so much that He gave His only Son. And whoever believes in Him will go to heaven and live with Him forever. That's it. That's the gospel right there. It's easy enough for someone that doesn't know theology or what it means, what eschatology means. They understand that Christ paid for their sins. And if we believe that, we can go to heaven. And then have a less than one minute preparation of sharing your testimony. You know, less than a minute. Well, this is the way I was before Jesus, and now this is what Jesus has changed in my life. Yes. Yes. That's real to them. That's something that they can relate to. How is Jesus going to change my life? So here's a couple more promises. See if you can, if you can tell, conditional or unconditional. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Pretty obvious, that's conditional, right? We've got to confess. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything. What does He cause? Everything. everything. To work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. i got to tell you, this verse is a promise that I lean on daily. It's helped me through many trials, heartbreaks, and disappointments. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you another story. Is that okay? I like to tell stories. You guys good with stories? This is a story about the king with one thumb. So there was a young boy in Africa who was going to be king. His father was the king, and he was the prince. And this, this young prince had a best friend who was a Christian. Now, the, the young prince wasn't a Christian. His family worshipped idols. But the young Christian studied his Bible, and he came across this verse, and he got so excited about how God works everything for our good that no matter what happened, he would say, this is good. No matter if it was tribulation, or something to be joyful about, he would say, this is good. Well, his buddy, the prince, kind of got tired of hearing that. Why do you always say, this is good? Even when they got in trouble at school, he said, this is good. The prince was like, man, you, you just, man, you're crazy. Well, the years went by, he became the king. And one day they were out hunting together. And as the king went to fire his weapon, it backfired and blew his thumb off. And what do you think his best friend said? This is good. This is good. Yeah. Well, that upset the king so much, 
that he took his friend and threw him in jail. In fact, he was so angry, he put him under the jail in the dungeon. And he stayed there for a year. Well, the king was out hunting by himself about a year later, and he got captured by a tribe of cannibals. And these cannibals took him back to their village, and they tied him to the stake, and they were about to light the fire to cook him, to eat him. And one of them noticed he was missing a thumb, and he went crazy. Oh, no, oh, no, he's not whole. He's evil, he's evil, he's brought a curse to us. So they untied him, and they kicked him out of the village. Well, he was so thankful for that, and he remembered what his friend had said, that this was good, so he ran back to the jail. He led his friend out of the jail and started loving on him. I'm so sorry I put you in jail. You said this was good, and it was good. I am so sorry I let you sit and rot in this jail for a whole year. And his friend said, I was in jail. It was good. He's like, oh, How can you say that? You were in jail for a year. He says, well, listen, if I wasn't in jail, I would have been out there hunting with you, and I have both thumbs. (laughs) So when you're going through a difficult time, and when it seems hopeless, and you feel like you're at the end, remember this promise. God's behind the scenes working your situation for your good. You know, He also promises that He will fight for us, that He will protect us. He will give us strength when we're weary and give us power when we're weak. He promises that no weapon formed against us will prosper. He will never leave us. He promises to comfort us, to give us wisdom, to deliver us and give us freedom, to give us the desires of our heart, to give us peace during times of confusion and turmoil, to bless us during tribulation. And the list goes on and on for over 7,400 times. So the difference between worldly hope and godly hope is that worldly hope is just a wish and it may not come true. Godly hope is expecting and knowing with great confidence that God's promises have and will come true. You know, I shared earlier about the hope of the little league player. Now I want to share a story of a boy whose life seemed hopeless. True story. This is the story of a little boy who grew up in the projects while his father was in prison and his mother and stepfather were alcoholics who were violent with each other and the police or an ambulance was often called to his home because of their fights. At 10 years old, his uncle molested him. He dropped out of school after the eighth grade and became a heroin addict. He was in and out of juvenile detention facilities for committing crimes to support his drug addiction until at age 17, he stood before a judge facing adult felony charges and a possible 10 years in prison. His life seemed hopeless. His only worldly hope was mercy from the court. He was offered a deal to join the army or go to prison. Now his only worldly hope was in the army. For the next 20 years, he did well in the army, but continued to use drugs and alcohol. He was a high-functioning addict. Early during that army career, he married a woman. They had a son together. And there, and there seemed to be a renewed worldly hope in his life. But soon after their marriage started, his wife cheated on him. His heart was crushed, and they were divorced. Drug use increased drastically. Again, his life seemed hopeless until he met another woman that seemed to be the answer to his search for real love. 
He adopted her son, and they had a daughter together. Worldly hope was flashing brightly in his life now. He continued to use drugs, however, and then he cheated on his wife. Their son became a gangbanger and a large-scale drug dealer. His wife attempted suicide. Utter hopelessness. Then their eight-year-old daughter introduced them to Jesus. The true meaning of hope had entered their lives. That was 23 years ago, and that little boy who once had only worldly hope now has a marriage that has become a godly example for other couples. You know, that, that young boy who was once a heroin-addicted criminal who dropped out of school after the eighth grade now stands before you today as a pastor with a doctoral degree. I stand before you today preaching about the very hope that seemed so far from me for the first 40 years of my life. Until I met Jesus, I had worldly hope. I was headed towards total destruction and death. You see, worldly hope is really no hope at all. The Bible tells us that those who do not trust in the Lord have no hope. And Job says in chapter 7, he says his life passes by quickly, but it comes to an end when there is no hope. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a number of years ago, these researchers got together and they wanted to do an experiment to see how hope affected folks that were going through a hardship. Yeah. So instead of people, you know what they used, right, Pastor? They used rats. Yeah. Oh, wow. So they, they took these rats and they separated them into two groups. They put, one, they put them each in a, in a separate tub of water that they had to swim in. They left one tub alone, and after an hour, the rats drowned. They all died. The other tub, during that hour, they went in periodically and lifted the rats up out of the water just, just for a second and put them back down. They did that two or three times during the hour. Then they left them alone. Those rats swam for 24 hours after that. Was it because they had some rest? I don't think so. It was because they had hope. They had hope that someone would come and reach down and rescue them. So they had hope for that. If those rats, unthinking rodents, if hope holds that much power with them, how much greater should its effect be in our lives since we know that someone has already reached down and rescued us and he promises to return again? Mm. Listen to what Paul is saying to the church, what he's saying to us about hope. He says, I have become its servant, talking about the church. I've become the church's servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is this mystery that's been hidden for ages? The mystery was that the Messiah would come to rescue us from the penalty of sin and live in us, guaranteeing our inheritance of glory. The Old Testament predicted the coming of the Messiah, but it did not reveal clearly that the Messiah would actually live in each member of His redeemed church, even Gentiles. Paul says that the riches of the glory of the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, Paul's saying that the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ is the guarantee of future glory to each believer, which means eternal life in heaven. That is the mystery, and that is our hope. Hmm. So this morning, 
I challenge you to restore your hope of glory and be confident that if there's been a recent death in your family and you feel alone or lost, Jesus Christ is your hope. Mm. When there are problems with your health or the health of a loved one, Christ is your hope. When there are problems at home with your marriage or prodigal children or finances, Jesus is your hope. When there are problems at work, Christ is your hope. When there are problems with sexual immorality or substance abuse, Jesus Christ is your hope. When there is any problem at all, there is hope. And that hope is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. We must begin to live as people with hope. Mm. Father, we thank you today <laughs> that you are our hope. We can't rely on worldly things, Lord. They all belong to you. We just need to be good stewards of them, God, and keep our eyes focused on you and hope in you. Amen. Thank you today, Lord, that you have brought this message of hope to your children. I pray that you would continue to work on their hearts, that there would be a change in their perspective, their worldly perspective would change to a biblical perspective. And we'll give you all the honor, all the glory. <laughs> you are an amazing God. I lift up the Christmas family right now to you, God, and you promise to be close to them. You promise <laughs> to rescue them and comfort them from their afflictions. So we stand on that promise today, Lord, and we celebrate your hope. It's in your son's name that we pray, Jesus Christ, amen, amen.